Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for attending um, today's Yang Time webinar. Um, we have distribution, past, present, and future with Brian Crookshank. Brian is the director of the University of the Aftermarket. He has spent his entire 22-year career in the auto care industry, first at Babcock's Media, where he covered the industry for a variety of publications. His last position at Babcock's was editor-in-chief of Counterman Magazine and aftermarketnews.com. At the University of the Aftermarket, Brian managed, manages all of Northwood University's continuing and executive education programs specific to the auto care industry. Brian stays on top of industry trends by remaining very active in the auto care industry, serving on committees within the Auto Care Association and the Automotive Warehouse Distributors Association. He is currently the chairman of the Northwood University Automotive Aftermarket Advisory Board, past board member of the Automotive Training Managers Council, and currently serves on the board of the Global Automotive Aftermarket Symposium Scholarship Committee. He was honored with the Mort Schwartz Education Award and the AIA Young Executive of the Year Award and the AWDA Pursuit of Excellence Award. He earned his Automotive Aftermarket Professional Designation from the University of the Aftermarket in 2004 and his Master Automotive Aftermarket Professional Designation in 2010. He is a proud graduate of The Ohio State University and Northwood University's DeVos Graduate School of Management where he earned an MBA. So without further ado, I'm gonna pass it over to Brian Crookshank and enjoy the webinar. Thanks, Katie. Uh, yeah, this is Brian Crookshank, and I looked over the uh, the participant list, and there's lots of lots of friends on the list. So um, glad that you guys are here. Um, so let's let's begin. I have lots of stuff to cover, so I don't want to I don't want to delay. Um, the things that I'm going to cover in this webinar, um, we're going to focus on some history, and I and I think it's initially to in, in, to uh, focus on history because in order to understand, I think, where distribution is going, it's important to understand where distribution started and where it's been. I think if you look at the, the trajectory of distribution over the last 30 years, you'll get a good sense of where distribution um, is ultimately headed. So here um, are the things that we're going to talk about, beginnings of group distribution, the golden age of program distribution. Uh, consolidation, you're going to hear this theme over and over again as we go through this. Consolidation is impacting distribution in, in a major way. We'll look at today's distribution groups. We'll talk about three-step versus two-step company-owned versus independent stores. The, uh, the uh, quote-unquote retail distribution landscape, the current landscape of all distribution, and then maybe make some um, some um, come up with some ideas of what distribution might look in, like in the future. Um, unlike past webinars, I've asked Katie to allow questions as we go. Um, the questions will come up in a little box on my computer. I, I'm going to try to get to them if I can. Um, if you have a question, please identify what company you're with. And if I can get to that uh, question, I will. Um, or it might be something that I'm going to get to a little bit later. So if I ignore your question, it's not that I hate you. It's just um, I uh, may be getting to it later in the webinar. Okay. So here we go. Where is the 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 focus of power in in the auto care industry? Um, you ask people that, and you're going to get lots of lots of different answers. Most people would tell you that the the focus of power in in the industry is at the end at the end user so that could be the the motorist who decides where to get his or her vehicle repaired or um, more commonly in the industry you might get the answer that it's it's the service the service technician the person who is making the branding decisions and, and deciding how and where and when to to service a vehicle my contention is that the focus of power in the motor vehicle aftermarket is at the distribution level. These are all. These are where all the major customers are. These are um, the groups in the industry that are making the biggest buying decisions. And with that kind of influence comes great power. I mentioned that there is great consolidation going on um, within within distribution and. 
with consolidation, this power is becoming more centralized on a smaller number of customers, and this can put great pressure on uh, on the industry, particularly at the supplier level. And we'll talk about all that stuff as as we get through this. So just to remind everybody what the University of the Aftermarket is, if, if you don't know, uh, it's simply just an, an educational alliance of the major trade associations that provides university level industry specific education programs to motor vehicle aftermarket professionals. Um, the University of the Aftermarket, although owned by the major trade associations, is, is housed at Northwood University. Um, here uh, on our campus in, in uh, Midland, Michigan, although I'm from an, I live uh, and work out of an office in uh, Pasadena, California. Uh, here's uh, just a, a picture of our Sloan Family Aftermarket Building, uh, sorry, the Sloan Family Building for Aftermarket Studies on our Midland campus. Uh, it's one of many buildings on our campus, but it's where the University of the Aftermarket lives, and it's where we host many of our, our major programs. Those of you who have attended or will attend Leadership 2.0, uh, it's held uh, here at the Sloan Building. The University of the Aftermarket uh, grants certificate programs. So if you see AAP or MAAP after somebody's name, that means that they have uh, um, gone through the procedure of, of accumulating credits by attending educational programs throughout the industry. Um, and uh, they're granted uh, AAP or MAAP designation after their name once they, um, once they um, fulfill all the requirements. There's more information on that at our website, universityoftheaftermarket.com. Here's some upcoming programs for the University of the Aftermarket. We just completed Aftermarket 101, which is usually for folks who have six months or less experience in the industry. Uh, that program sold out, so we're going to do it again in October. Heavy duty leadership will start in July. Um, we do a, a data standards program in August. Uh, leadership 2.0 will take place August the 23rd through the 28th, and then reconvene again in April of 2016. Um, this is the last class. What a good looking group of aftermarket professionals. Um, I know that there is a Yang scholarship to this program. It is a full scholarship. This program is $6,300, and so the scholarship covers the whole thing. So if you're interested in, um, in attending this, this program, um, Yang is offering a scholarship, and there's a procedure to, uh, uh, to apply. Okay, enough of that. All industries go through a life cycle. And I and I want to I want to lay out what that life cycle is so that you can see what the life cycle is and 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 you'll see how it applies to our industry. It starts with the entrepreneur. This goes back, you know, maybe a hundred years in our business. It starts with a somebody who has an idea. They're going to fix cars or they're going to make a product or whatever. And so they have this idea and they start on their own as an entrepreneur and it gets big enough that they need help. So they, they bring in friends and family. Eventually this becomes a, a legal company. Eventually these local companies become regionalized. After that we see syndicates of these regional companies forming. Then we see national companies. From there we see the influx of public money, Companies go public on the New York Stock Exchange, the NASDAQ, the Toronto Stock Exchange, the DAX, the Nikkei, whatever. We see private equity and international money and internationals coming into domestic markets. Um, this is how pretty much all industries go. Our industry is absolutely no different. So let's go back to that entrepreneur, family, legal company era of the motor vehicle aftermarket. So there were stores all over the United States that had to uh, sell product to service dealers or to DIYers to fix cars. And there were warehouses all over the United States. Eventually, because of inventory requirements, to fulfill um, the uh, the inventory requirements of stores. 
So these dots on this uh, on this this map, this is not uh, accurate at all. Back in the 1920s, there were thousands and thousands and thousands and thousands of warehouse distributors all over the United States, and uh, each one of them dealt individually with the manufacturers. They struck their own deals. Um, they went to market under their own brand. It was it was fairly uh, inefficient and very, 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 very fragmented. By the way, today we have about five to six hundred warehouse distributors in the United States. Eventually these warehouses, because of uh, because of consolidation, became became regionalized. And um, and so that's when we entered the regionalization era of warehouse distribution. So we had far fewer warehouses and they were servicing uh, areas regionally. In 1925, a group of, of these warehouses got together in Dearborn, Michigan. And they had a meeting because they had an idea. And the idea was this. If we got together and we bought collectively, maybe we could get a better price from the manufacturer. So there were 68 warehouses at this meeting, and they decided, yeah, we're going to form an organization, and we are going to buy collectively from the manufacturer. They had to decide what they were going to call themselves, so they called themselves the National Auto Parts Association, and that later became NAPA. So originally, there were 68 independently owned warehouse, dis uh, warehouse distributor uh, members of the NAPA organization. Uh, in fact, if, if you call Atlanta, the uh, NAPA headquarters today, they'll still refer to it as NAPA. They answer the phone and they say, it's a great day at NAPA. So this idea of, of warehouses becoming part of something bigger to, um, to bring some efficiencies in their buying, really, um, became uh, very, very prevalent in in the United States. So here we are back to our back to my very inaccurate um, map of the United States. All these warehouses, all these thousands and thousands of warehouses, got together and formed buying groups. Now this map is uh, not inaccurate. In 1979, these were the locations of the buying groups in the United States. So all those thousands of warehouses all joined these buying groups all over the United States. Um, I, I have the Napa logo up there in Dearborn, Michigan uh, because that's where they were headquartered initially. Um, I think everybody knows that um, that Napa is now headquartered down in um, uh, in Atlanta. So Big A was was uh, was in Houston, and Bumper to Bumper was in Kansas City, and CarQuest was in Memphis, uh, Parts Plus was in Memphis, and it still is today. Pronto was in Springfield. So this idea of of the program group became the prevalent method of traditional distribution in the United States. And here's just a definition of uh, of program group. It's a group of independently owned WDs that pools resources. Um, its primary function is to buy on behalf of its members, but they, they do a lot of other things too, um, and those things were added, those were added over time. The 1970s and 80s were considered the golden age of program distribution, and here's the list of distribution groups in 1979. The ones in yellow are the ones that either still exist today or aspects of them still exist today. So the list on the left is the, the, the list of groups that we had in 1979, and then um, other groups formed after 1979, and I've, I've listed some of them. Uh, TrueStar, by the way, I, I should mention is, is, still, is still around, as is EPG and AIM, and I'm not sure about AP, APPI and Eagle Nation. So here we are at the syndicate era. Of, of the auto care industry, where all these warehouses are forming syndicates around the United States. Fast forward 20 years, or 10 years really, uh, and in 1990 these were the major distribution groups, and this, it, this list is probably starting to look a lot more familiar to you.
back to our friends at Napa, there was consolidation going on within the Napa organization. I originally said that there were 68 warehouse members. Um, by the mid-1990s, there were only three warehouse members of Napa. What happened to the 65 warehouses? Well, they were acquired by primarily the Genuine Parts Company. Now, the Genuine Parts Company was not the largest member originally of Napa, but over time, through consolidation, they acquired up many, many, many of the members of the Napa organization. So by the mid-90s, we ended up with the Napa organization that had, a, that had essentially only three warehouse members. This consolidation of the groups was happening all over um, the United States in just about every single group. Um, Automotive Distribution Network is the result of uh, the consolidation of several groups, Parts Plus, IAPA, IWD, CMB, um, Aftermarket Auto Parts Alliance uh, is, the, is the merging of all pro bumper to bumper and auto value. Um, this kind of thing was happening at, at, at all the groups. Now, what is driving this? What's, what's driving it, um, if you remember back to the NAPA example, is, is member consolidation. So you often have a member within these groups that buy other members. So you'll end up with, you might start with 68 warehouse members, like in the, in the uh, example of Napa, and then that, that ends up getting down to three or two or, or whatever, um, because one member or several members are buying up all the other members. Now, if you look, think about the example of, uh, of, of Aftermarket Auto Parts Alliance, where we had many groups merging together, all pro, bumper to bumper, and auto value, why would, why would that happen? Well, sometimes members consolidate with members from outside their group. The most important thing that a program group has, let me underscore this, the most important thing a program group has is its buying volume. If it loses volume, it really can't exist. I'll give you an example. There was a, a group called IAPA. And the largest warehouse member of IAPA was a company called Modi. It was owned by the Buzzard family, and it stands for Middle Atlantic Warehouse Distributors. And Modi, as the largest member of IAPA, had the vast majority of the volume in the group. Well, in the late 90s, a company, part of the Parts Plus group called Uniselect, acquired Modi. Okay, so Modi gets stripped out of IAPA. Well, what happens to IAPA? IAPA is now left with, you know, really not enough volume to make purchasing, uh, to make good or efficient or beneficial purchasing decisions on, the, on behalf of the members that were left. So IAPA really had no choice but to merge with another group. So here we are with the, the groups that we have today, Aftermarket Auto Parts Alliance, a lot of people just call it the Alliance. Automotive Parts Services Group, I'll talk about that in a second because that's very, very new. Automotive Distribution Group, people call it ADN or the network. Um, APA, people call it surprisingly APA. And then there's some, some niche groups uh, like EPG and, and, and TrueStar. So the legacies of these consolidated groups still remain. Aftermarket Auto Parts Alliance still goes to market under two brands, Auto Value and Bumper to Bumper. Now it's not because they created these two brands, it's because these two brands are the legacies of two program groups that were merged uh, into the alliance. Likewise, the recent merger, well, they call it a partnership, between Prano and Federated, we, you know, we still have these, and we, and we will, um, these two brands, Prano and Federated in the market. Um, same thing with ADN. Speaking of ADN, uh, this legacy leads to really sometimes some very convoluted uh, complexity. ADN, because of the 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 uh, the groups that uh, that it, that it has uh, 
merged together ends up dealing with um, with like all these these uh, um, brands and that's just that's just because of legacy I am sure the ADN headquarters would prefer to deal with just one brand but you were bringing in brands from all over the place when you start to merge these these groups together so what about Napa and what about CarQuest? Uh, those were the largest and probably best known of the groups over time. So let's let's talk about those guys uh, quickly. Um, Napa ended up consolidating itself down to just one warehouse member, the Genuine Parts Company. So uh, now Napa isn't really a program group anymore. They are a company that has a brand, and that brand is Napa. By the way, Scott, I see that you've asked me a question, but I can't figure out how to how to get to it. So, sorry, <laughs> I apologize. Um, CarQuest, yeah, what about CarQuest? So, CarQuest had a bunch of warehouse members. The largest warehouse member of CarQuest, uh, <laughs> Scott, I, I see your awe. Yeah, sad face. Sorry. Um, uh, CarQuest, their largest warehouse member was a company called. General Parts Inc., or they later changed it to General Parts International. Um, they were acquired by Advanced Auto Parts. So, effectively, CarQuest as a group uh, no longer exists. There are still thousands, though, independent CarQuest stores, and there is speculation about what's going to happen to those independent CarQuest stores. Uh, they could be right across the street from an advance. So um, it, 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 uh, it will be very, very interesting to see how all that shakes out. So here's the logos of the major groups. I put Pronto and Federated kind of on top of each other because they are the ones who recently announced, um, they're, they're calling it a partnership rather than a merger. Um, they have partnered into a group called uh, The Group or Automotive Parts Services Group. Uh, down at the bottom, you see kind of these niche players, TrueStar and, and EPG. On the heavy-duty side, these are the two major distribution groups of uh, on the heavy-duty side, Vipar Heavy Duty and HDA Truck Pride. It will not surprise you that HDA was a separate group at one time and Truck Pride was a separate group at one time and they merged. And so now you get uh, the, uh, the new name of HDA Truck Pride. So this consolidation of groups uh, just keeps marching on and on and on, and it's because of consolidation of the warehouse members within the group. I'll give you three examples. So I mentioned GPC acquiring all the warehouse members within Napa. So now you end up with Napa that, that just has, it's owned by GPC. O'Reilly used to be a member of Auto Value, and they got big enough that they didn't need to be in a group anymore, so they left. Now imagine if you're that group, and O'Reilly leaves you. That's a lot of volume to lose. On the Fisher side, Fisher is the largest warehouse member of Federated Auto Parts, and Fisher, uh, over the years, is slowly uh, acquiring more and more Federated members. Now, I'm not saying that what I'm about to suggest is, is going to happen, but it's, it's, I think it's an important exercise to think along these terms. If Fisher is the largest warehouse member of Federated, what would happen to Federated if O'Reilly bought Fisher? Hmm. So here are the major groups, just some, some details about them. Aftermarket Auto Parts Alliance, headquartered in San Antonio. Uh, John Washbish, a proud Northwood grad, is the president. So the number of WD members. They have 53 WD members, but it's, it's not really important. The number of members is not, is not what's important here. The volume, that's what's important. Now, getting to what the volume is of these companies or of these uh, these uh, these program groups is very very difficult. Um, Alliance would probably tell you that their volume is four to five billion, um, and we have to go by what they say. 
Um, but no one really, really knows outside of these organizations what their buying volume is. Um, you're dealing with 53 independent independent warehouses, um, so it's it's really difficult to know what the volume levels are of of these of these groups. Suffice to say, their volume is enough. <laughs> it's enough to be a group to whatever level that is. So here's some some members. Uh, by the way, the alliance calls it shareholders. That's what they call their 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 members. Uh, APH, uh, Autowares, Han, Replacement Parts, Merrill. Uh, these are all some of the larger warehouse members of the Alliance. ADN, I put a little asterisk next to Mike Lambert's name. Mike is retiring at the end of the year, and all indications are that Dave Prater will, will take his, his place. And, and there's some of the uh, member examples of, of ADN. Federated, Roanoke, Virginia. Uh, sorry, they're in Stanton, Virginia. I don't know why this is Roanoke. Um, by far, the largest member of Federated is, is Fisher. Uh, Pronto. Here's some of the major members of Pronto. And and Federated and Pronto, as I mentioned, have have uh, entered into agree an agreement to uh, to be part of this this automotive parts services group banner. And then. On the smaller side of the national groups is uh, is is APA. So the the roles that that a program group fulfills are more than just buying. They do advertising and branding and co-man warehouse, data warehouse. That's where they they accumulate all the 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 buying and all the inventory and stuff of all of their members, and they can benchmark off of each other. Um, they offer financing and insurance and, and all that stuff. Private label is is perhaps one of the most important things that a that a group offers its members. Uh, I, I mentioned these three. Uh, Parts Master is the Alliance private label. CarQuest was the private label of the CarQuest group. Now that CarQuest has been acquired by Advance, there is speculation in the market about what's going to happen to the CarQuest brand. My sense is that the CarQuest brand will uh, live on inside of Advance, uh, probably as its its house professional brand. I, I would imagine. Um, again, if I'm an independent CarQuest store and my CarQuest product is in an Advance store, um, that might make make me a little more a little uncomfortable. Napa is probably the best example of a a uh, a mature, well managed house brand. Um, it's probably the model that everybody is chasing. The Napa brand is very respected. Technicians know and love it, and I think um, uh, even companies like AutoZone would would perhaps love for Duralast to someday be perceived in the market as the Napa brand is. So at the heart of the groups are these are these warehouse distributors, and I, I mentioned it before. They're they're independent warehouses um, that that buy product, and 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 usually that product, the the price is negotiated by the group. Now my little note here says program group membership uh, greatly impacts the brands of products that the WD sources. This is because of the issue of compliance. Um, groups have preferred members, or sorry, preferred vendors. And there are uh, benefits for their warehouse members to buy the uh, the, the preferred brand. Uh, there are compliance requirements, and just as a matter of history, the more compliant groups are the ones that are still around, versus some of the groups that were that that had less stringent compliance requirements. And that makes sense if you think about the volume issue. If you have strict compliance and all of your members are going to buy all the same brand of belts, for example, well, that gives you the maximum amount of buying volume power possible from all your members. So here's just some examples of some 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 warehouses. For those of you on the manufacturing side who who deal with or might deal with uh, some of the groups. You probably know 
who all the warehouse members are within the group. These warehouse members, and by the way, these, these warehouses that are on the screen are members of a bunch of different groups, but the warehouse members of program groups, that's where all the decisions are made. Program groups are, 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 um, are organized by, by committees, and they have a product committee, and an IT committee, and a marketing committee, and, and all that stuff. So the decisions about what product the group is going to buy, it is determined not by the headquarters, but it's determined by the product committee within the, uh, with, with, within the, within the, uh, the program group. So now we're getting into, into uh, uh, company-owned stores versus independent. There, there was a shift in the 1990s when, when WDs started owning their own stores. Long time ago, WDs didn't own stores. They, um, they simply sent product to a store they didn't own. So let's talk about this, this idea of company-owned versus independent. So uh, McDonald's has, uh, has stores, and some of them are owned by McDonald's, and some of them are are owned by by a guy who owns a McDonald's franchise. It's sort of the same way um, with 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 our industry. So if you look at the Napa example, um, there are a thousand locations that are owned by GPC. A thousand Napa stores that are owned by the Genuine Parts Company, and those are company-owned stores that buy all of their product from Napa distribution centers. Then there are five thousand locations that are independently owned. Napa stores, they probably, you know, they do buy the majority of their product from Napa, but they, they don't have to. So this idea of three-step distribution versus two-step distribution is, is a shift that's going on in the industry. Um, it's, it started out as three-step distribution where the independent warehouse would sell product to an independent jobber, and then the independent jobber would sell it to an independent service dealer. These days, it is primarily two-step distribution, where the warehouse either sells it directly to the service dealer, or the warehouse sends the product to a store that it already owns, and then that store sends it to, uh, to a service dealer. So, uh, I've already covered this. There's been tremendous consolidation among uh, traditional WDs, resulting in a much smaller universe of customers. This is, this is probably a very uncomfortable thing for a manufacturer. Years ago, there were, you know, say, 20 program groups through which you could sell your product. Well, if there's four major distribution groups in the market today, that is a much smaller universe of customers through which you can sell. The, all, while all this is going on, the retailers are growing, and here are the major retailers in the market. Now let's let's talk about this term, R retailers. Michael Rukoff, I see you have a question, but again, I I don't know how to um, how to access your question, so I I apologize. Hey Brian, let's if you click on it. It should populate underneath. Sorry. It should do what? Uh, if you click on the question, it should populate underneath it. Yeah, it doesn't. Uh, not, Sorry. Okay. okay. Sorry. Sorry, Michael. Um, I think there's going to be a way for people to email me questions when all this is over, so I, I, I can answer it that way. Let's talk about this term retailers. This, this term retailer persists, and this is a bit of a legacy from when Advance, O'Reilly, and AutoZone were primarily retail-focused organizations. It's not really uh, what they are today or certainly what they want to be. A better term might be chain auto parts stores, probably, because they're, they're all company owned. And by the way, they're all publicly, publicly traded. So let's look at these, at these, uh, at these retailers. So um, Advance Auto has 5,200 stores. WorldPack, which is their import expediter, they have 100 distribution centers, and they operate in 49 states. Puerto Rico, uh, Virgin Islands, and Canada. Uh, as I mentioned, they recently acquired CarQuest and General Parts, so they brought in uh, to the advanced organization a lot of wholesale-focused stores, because that's what CarQuest was. It was a whole, primarily a wholesale-focused business, 
and you'll see a little later when we look at the wholesale retail mixes, you'll see how this changed advances wholesale retail mix. AutoZone, um, okay, so I see, for some reason I can get Justin's question. Where do I, Justin asks, where do I think three-step distribution is uh, is headed? Um, I, I think I, I think three-step distribution is um, clearly the market is headed toward a two-step model. That's, and I think long-term that's that's the model. Do I think that there's that there's room for an independently owned part store? Yes, but on the overall, I think two-step distribution is absolutely the the future of. Um, of the industry only because that's been the major trend over the last 20 years. Okay, so here we are at AutoZone, a little over 5,000 stores, but but they are in Mexico and Brazil, so that the total store count actually is more than more than advance. IMC is their import uh, expediter. O'Reilly, a little better than 4,400 stores in 43 states. They made a ma major acquisition several years ago of CSK. They were uh, headquartered in, they were a retail focused organization headquartered in Phoenix and they went to market under the Checker, Shucks and Kragen Auto Parts brands. They have recently, probably within the last year, uh, um, completed the changeover of all those stores. So you won't see Checker, Shucks or Kragen stores anymore. They're all, they're all um, O'Reilly stores now. The goal, I think, of of O'Reilly and and AutoZone and Advance is 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 to develop a, a mix of sorry of 50% retail walk-in sales and 50% wholesale. I put O'Reilly uh, kind of larger on the slide because for a long time that's what O'Reilly was. They uh, they were very successful at maintaining both 50% wholesale and 50% retail. They are not these days, and it's because of the uh, CSK acquisition. They acquired a large retail-focused uh, organization, so it has skewed their numbers toward the retail end. Um, O'Reilly is slowly bringing more wholesale business into those old CSK stores, so um, we should see that number get closer to 50, 50 for them. Uh, in a second, we'll see where AutoZone and Advance are. Uh, it's because it, I, I think that that's interesting. So why would these companies want to have 50-50 um, sales mixes uh, when they historically were primarily retail focused? Well, it, it's because the future of the market is in DIFM. Um, Certainly, there is there is DIY retail business going on in the market. But if you if you look out long term, the DIFM side of the market is the growth side of the market, and there's lots of I think fairly obvious reasons why that's the case. Um, technology is probably the number one reason. It's just very difficult, if not impossible, for your average Joe Shade Tree mechanic to work on his vehicle on the weekend. So as these companies try to address the needs of the wholesale market, the DIFM market, I think it's, and, and also remembering that these companies are all publicly held, it's important to remember that, that the shift to adding DIFM or wholesale business has immense implications to the balance sheet. To be a DIY retail focused store um, requires, you know, a, probably a modest level of inventory. To add commercial sales is a completely different ball game. You have to add an immense amount of inventory and that ends up looking rather unfavorable on the balance sheet, especially when you consider that the average turns in the industry are less than two. Average turns in the industry are actually 1.4 turns of inventory annually. Um, so there's a lot of inventory that you have to have. There's a lot of inventory that ends up sitting around. And then of course, if you're gonna add DIFM commercial sales, 
you're going to have to add personnel who know what the heck they're doing, and you're going to have to add infrastructure, things like delivery. All of this is very, very, very expensive. The retailers, probably, this is just my, my personal uh, thoughts on this, because they're publicly traded, so they have to show growth, and so they said, okay, well, we're going to show growth by adding commercial business. That's how we're going to grow our business and make our shareholders happy. Well, if you're going to do that, now you got to write a big check for all of this inventory. So I think the retailers were like, oh, well, what are we going to do? We don't want to buy all this inventory. So the AutoZone came up with this idea of pay on scan where uh, manufacturers would consign inventory to AutoZone and the inventory would be owned by the manufacturer, but it would live at live at AutoZone and the the manufacturer would get paid when the product was purchased so when it was scanned for purchase then the manufacturer would get would get ultimately paid lots of problems with that um, namely when you only have 1.4 turns it's going to take forever for manufacturers to get paid so um, and then there were also some um, some some issues with uh, with the banks won't guarantee consigned inventory and that, and that kind of stuff. Um, so what they have done lately uh, for the past several years is is factoring. And factoring, let me go back. Factoring is um, actually reverse factoring. Factoring is when you factor uh, on the uh, receivable side, but reverse factoring is when you are factoring on the on the payable side. So here's the scenario where inventory is factored. A draft note is issued to a manufacturer based on the credit of the distributor. The manufacturer can then take that note to the bank, which is the factor, and be paid immediately less some percent. The getting paid immediately thing is important because AutoZone and others like AutoZone have managed to negotiate terms that sometimes can exceed 400 days. So if you're a manufacturer and you're agreeing to these 400 days of terms to get paid um, from AutoZone, well, you want to wait 400 days to get paid? I, I certainly don't. So they enter in, into these factoring programs so that they can get paid right away, less a percent. Okay. Um, here's a list of the top 20 store owners in the United States 10 years ago. And on the right, I have uh, put on uh, there if, if they have some sort of group affiliation. Uh, and then on the left is the name of the, of the company plus uh, how many stores they had in 2005. It, here's a list of those same stores, but what happened to them between 2005 and 2015. And you'll see there's, there's been tremendous consolidation of, of, these, um, of these distribution groups. So General Parts was acquired by Advance, CSK, I mentioned was acquired by O'Reilly. Uni sold off its U.S. operations to uh, to Icon, uh, Carl Icon. Uh, Murray is acquired by O'Reilly, et cetera, et cetera. So here's the top store owners today. Advance has 5,200 stores. The uh, the number in parentheses is the number of stores they had 10 years ago. So you can kind of see the the amount of growth that AutoZone has had, for example. Uh, between 2005 and 2015. They went from 2,600 stores to over 5,000 stores in 10 years. And they're going to add 150 to 250 stores every year moving forward. I'll also point out, look at the difference between store counts between the first three and the last, say, 5 through 12. I didn't list 13 through 20 because, I mean, those guys have less than 50 stores. Is, 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 it, even worth, is it even worth talking about?
So here we are on the retail versus wholesale um, mixes. So the first number is the retail mix, is, is the retail percent of business. And uh, the second number is the wholesale mix of business. So Advanced Auto Parts was primarily a retail business. Um, probably looked much closer to what AutoZone is, 85% retail, 15% wholesale. Advance, um, geez, what, what they did is they went out and they, they bought wholesale business because they acquired GPI, they acquired all those CarQuest stores, they essentially bought wholesale business. Pep Boys is, is, a, is a very different model than, than what most distribution companies are doing. Um, you'll see that 11% that of their, of their uh, business is service. Um, many, not many, but not all Pep Boys locations have have uh, um, bays. Fisher, uh, for whatever reason, uh, indicated when they reported that they have they have no retail business. I I I, I tend to discount that. Um, they're probably more likely 25% retail, 75% wholesale, and and that's what you're going to see mostly with a wholesale focused organization. Yeah, so we kind of went through this whole life cycle, right, from the, from the entrepreneur to the family to the company to the regional to the syndicate to the national and the growth of the publicly traded companies, AutoZone, Advance, O'Reilly, GPC, Pep Boys, those are all publicly traded. Now we're seeing the influx of the other, these other entities that are entering our market, and we, we haven't quite figured out what impact Amazon, Rock, eBay, and others like U.S. Auto Parts are going to have on on the market. I will say this: the 30-minute delivery, the the success of these guys in the DIFM space hinges on the 30-minute delivery. So. If the 30-minute delivery, if that customer expectation disappears for some reason, then that gives a much greater foothold or potential for companies like Amazon and Rock Auto and eBay, which might not be able to get you the product for a, a day or so. So I mentioned that we've kind of gone through the, the, the entire life cycle of, of, uh, of an industry. And we are now at the, the end stage where we have public, private equity, and, and, international, and international companies and money uh, making great, uh, having great influence on, um, on the distribution space. So the future, um, WD consolidation absolutely will continue, and I think in the next five years we're going to see um, some major, major consolidation going on, continuing to go on, go on in the uh, in uh, among WDs. That will probably necessitate program group consolidation. Um, we may see the uh, the increased interest in distribution by by uh, private equity. The retailers, the publicly traded chain stores, will absolutely, will absolutely um, continue to add stores and, and make acquisitions. I, I think those guys are, are going to continue to grow a lot. Remember, they're publicly traded. They have to grow. Um, and pay attention to their stock price, too. Uh, AutoZone, because of this factoring program, has an accounts receivable to inventory ratio of 115%. That means that AutoZone effectively owns no inventory. They're throwing off over a billion dollars in free cash every year. And so they've been able to buy back their stock price, and I think these days AutoZone stock price is near, um, near $500 a share. And we will certainly con continue to see new entrants. And, um, you know the impact that that the internet's parts vendors will have on the market. I think is is something really really to watch. I know that that Amazon and others have made some strategic partners with some warehouses that maybe act as fulfillment 
for them. Uh, and it will be just very interesting to see the impact that the Internet uh, parts guys will have on distribution. Uh, it is a fascinating, fascinating part of the industry to watch. Uh, I, as I said in the very beginning, I believe that that the very center of power uh, of the of the motor vehicle aftermarket of the aftermarket industry um, is 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 squarely on distribution. And where distribution goes, everybody else is going to follow. I truly believe, and I don't have any any data to support this, but I do believe that distribution's consolidation um, is the du directly impacts manufacturer consolidation. So if we agree that WDs will continue to consolidate, then I would believe that manufacturers will continue to consolidate as well. Uh, let me see, I see that there's a question here. Referring back to two-step versus three-step, you said you see two-step prevailing in Napa's case with their client base being over 83%. Do you see GPC acquiring more independent Napa's, converting them to two-step? You know, that, that that's an interesting question. Uh, no, only because Napa's, um, Napa's store count the, the, the number of stores that GPC owns has stayed at about 900 or 1,000 for a very long time. So that doesn't seem like something that, that um, I've seen no movement at GPC to indicate that that's, that that's true. I think I'm at my, yeah, so I'm, I, think I'm, I think I made it. So thank you very, very much for your, uh, for your attention. Um, please send me questions. I know that, that uh, Courtney has set up some sort of um, way that, that you guys can send me questions. I'd, I'd be happy to, to answer those. I, I covered a ton of stuff, and uh, I really, really thank you for your, for your attention. Brian, thank you so much for um, that webinar. That was great, and I apologize for the technical difficulties difficulty with the questions. I have them all written down. Unfortunately, we're out of time for today, so we, I will submit those to Brian and we'll get those answered. But we are, we have made some time available for Brian to answer questions on Yang Connect. Um, so look um, in your email for the announcement about that, but I believe that's going to be next week. So there's going to be um, some time for you to submit questions and he will be able to answer them. So stay tuned for uh, Yang Connect um, on that. And Brian, if you could go to the next slide. Um, and Yang is now accepting applications um, to award one deserving Yang member a scholarship uh, for Leadership 2.0, which Brian mentioned at the beginning. So um, if you haven't done so already, check that out. Um, it's available at autocare.org slash Yang. And then our next webinar is with autocare. Um, Andres, um, can you, can you Go to them. Thank you. Globalization is impact on the auto care industry. Um, so registration will open up next week. Um, so check your email for that. But Thursday, June 18th at 3 p.m. Eastern time. So thank you, everyone, for your participation. And have a great weekend. Thanks, everybody. Katie, you still there?